hear and respond to the Word of God, written and spoken. Follow along as I read this, please. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may the Lord stir in us through celebrating the Lord's Supper together again today, through looking at this text together, that the gospel thrives when hos hospitality is ever-present, ever-showing, when the welcoming spirit is there. It is part of the very heartbeat of the gospel. Thank you. Please be seated. We began last Sunday looking at this. We're, we're in this overarching theme. We're going through uh, one anothering, living in, in gospel community. Uh, looking last week at cultivating a welcoming culture toward one another. You see that addressed in the text. Last week we talked about how this text unfolds. The Verse 4, the instruction of the scriptures. Verses 5 and 6, the desire for harmony. Verse 7, cultivating a welcoming culture. We looked at all of that together. Today I want you to think with me. Put yourself at Pentecost. Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. Passover. Fifty days after Jesus had celebrated in that upper room with the twelve. We know that from John's gospel that that evening began with him doing something very unusual. He took a towel, a wash basin, and he washed their feet. That, that symbol, we've talked about that before, it was one of, the, one of the lowliest things a servant in the household would be assigned to do. Yet he did that toward the twelve that night. It was a definite demonstration of hospitality and welcoming. When a, when a servant would wash your feet, when you would journey to someone's home, it was a powerful symbol that the host of the home was welcoming you into their home. And Jesus did that that night, demonstrating a powerful manifestation of his welcoming to his disciples. I would submit to you they picked that up. When you fast forward 50 days later, put yourself at Pentecost. In fact, put yourself as one who journeyed to Jerusalem for Passover. Coming from all over the known world, making a, a faithful pilgrimage, a Jewish head of household doing what his father had done and his father before him had done for generations at great inconvenience taking the family on pilgrimage to be in Jerusalem for Passover. Taking with you along the way or even securing when you were there a spotless lamb, one fit to be slaughtered by the priests as the blood ran thick at Passover. And remaining in the celebration, perhaps leading up to Pentecost, the, the feast of the 50 days of the seven sabbatic cycles plus one day. And you knew that this Passover was different because somehow in the, in the middle of Passover, a Jewish rabbi who had apparently stirred up the uh, anger of the Roman government and somehow had even seen the Sanhedrin turn against him that he had been executed with two common criminals, two thieves. It was an unusual Passover for that to take place. Normally, Jews would have put a moratorium 
on any sorts of trials and charges during that holy season. For some reason, they had gone along with the Romans. In fact, insisted that the Romans execute this rabbi. He was not one of theirs. He had not come out of one of their schools. So it was a way that they could silence someone who threatened them at the same time, demonstrate to the Roman government, we recognize your authority. So that has happened. And then news a few days later that his tomb is empty, that he's not there. And then more news that he's appeared here and there to his disciples. And all you were doing was going to Jerusalem for Passover. And then news coming. That he'd been taken up. A great throng had seen him. You see, all this was happening around them. And then we're told in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, that there were 120 gathered in the upper room. They were gathered there, praying. Jesus had met them a couple of times in that upper room. He had come right through the door without it being open. Pentecost comes. They've been gathered in the upper room. And they come out of the upper room. Empowered. Perhaps when they initially gathered, they were gathered there in fear in the early days after the crucifixion. Wondering if they were going to be discovered, found out to be followers of this Jesus of Nazareth. And if they were going to face the same fate that he did, crucified as an insurrectionist, someone challenging the authority of Rome. This time something happened. We're told the Spirit of God descended upon them in power. Jesus had promised that in the upper room discourse recorded by John. It's necessary that I go away and I will send the Comforter. He will come. He will lead you into all truth. He will teach you. Through Him you will do mighty things. And the Spirit comes in power. He invades their lives. The new birth becomes a reality and they come bursting out of the upper room, preaching in power. And there's this crowd that gathers. People from all over the known world, people who speak different dialects, though they're, they would trace their origins back to Judaism. And these disciples, these formerly timid disciples, begin to preach to the crowd. And a miracle occurs. Not only the miracle of the, of the divine outpouring of the Spirit, like tongues of fire lighting upon them. And we really don't know where the miracle took place, whether it was the translation of what they were saying into the tongue of everyone listening, or whether these disciples were empowered to speak to them in their native dialects. But this much is sure. Each one heard in his own language the glorious good news that Messiah had come. You had come to Passover as an annual pilgrimage demonstrating your hope for Messiah, your longing for the day, your willingness to sacrifice a lamb, knowing that without the shedding of blood there can be no forgiveness of sins. That symbolically the lamb meant that you would be right before God for another year. And deep in the heart there was the aching for Messiah. And these fellows tell you Messiah has come. And the scripture records in Acts chapter 2 that 3,000 souls were added that day. If husband and wife were saved together, if, if a wife from one home, a husband from one home, Anywhere from 1,500 and up households were radically transformed that day. 
because all they had done was come to Jerusalem for Passover. Their lives were changed. No doubt some returned to their homelands, and, and that would explain the beginning works of the gospel, seed sown in these places. But many stayed. Wouldn't you have stayed? If the very thing you had longed for is a good, practicing Orthodox Jew, you now discovered had actually taken place. Jesus of Nazareth was not some off-the-rails rabbi. He was the Son of God. And then reality sets in. You see, as you think about it, these Jews had been staying in the homes of other Jews, staying in the limited hotel space, if we can call it that. Most of them in something more akin to a bed and breakfast arrangement. And now they go back to their hosts and tell them, Jesus of Nazareth, crucified by the Jewish leaders, by the Sanhedrin, handing him over to Rome is the Son of God. And the church is birthed at Pentecost. And the 120 and their families now face the daunting task of caring for all of these families. Brothers and sisters, you've got to put your, wrap this, your mind around this. That was no small challenge. How would the church respond? Well, thank God they did not respond, I'm really too busy for this. Thank God they did not respond, we can't be inconvenienced by this. Thank God they responded the ways recorded in Acts 2 and Acts 4. Look at this with me, if you would. In Acts 2, 42 to 47, this crowd growing from 120 to 3,000 and family members. It says, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They were devoted to one another. They were devoted to the, to the 11 who came out of the upper room at when the Lord's Supper was instituted, who had had one added to them because Judas, the one foretold to betray Jesus, had taken his own life. Matthias steps in. And these 12 de facto elders of the church in Jerusalem called them together to meet. Ponder for a moment, where did they meet? If there had been a place in Jerusalem big enough for them to meet, and there was, called the temple, they could not have rented it for all the shekels that could be gathered. So at great inconvenience, they meet. And they're taught. And they're exhorted. And the word begins to go, continues to go out so that several thousand more are added just a few days later. There is a an incredible downpour of the Spirit. There's a mighty awakening, an unbelievable revival that has, carries with it unimaginable challenges. Verse 43, And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Some people have taken this passage and they, they try to push on us uh, sort of a... Uh, proto-communism mentality. I think you missed the point when you, when you look at that. What you're seeing here is the heart of the gospel begin to be expressed. Hospitality. Harmony and hospitality. You're seeing a welcoming culture come into being. Verse 45, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. 
In this crowd, there were easily thousands of people who did not make plans for a long-term trip to Jerusalem, nor did they make plans to relocate to Jerusalem, and yet there they are in Jerusalem, lost in wonder, love, and praise, in devotion to the Lamb who was slain. Symbolized in the last Passover they celebrated, and yet now known by the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Verse 46, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Yes, they were still recognized as Jews. Paul, when he was first converted, continued to go into the temple, but as soon as he would declare Christ, he would be ushered out of the temple. They shared in their homes. They were glad. They'd not gotten over being brought savingly to Christ. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The phenomena continued. There is a revival taking place right now in eastern Tennessee. It's been going on for over a month now. The reports coming in seem to speak of a genuine work of God, a downpour, long desired prayer and fasting, gospel preaching, ministry, young people swept by droves into the kingdom. I read recently that in certain portions of Iran, you're hard pressed, hard pressed to find a practicing Muslim because revival has broken out in Iran. Very much on a scale like it did in China years ago, in North Korea before that. These people in Acts are experiencing an awakening. Jesus said, you'll see greater things than I've done. The largest crowd he ever had to preach to walked away. These are hungering. The Lord was adding day by day those who were being saved. We turn over to Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. We're told, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. There's your harmony. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. There's your hospitality. But they had everything in common. I would suggest to you that they were one anothering on an incredible scale. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was a need for great manifestations of grace. The grace of patience. The grace of letting go. The grace of thinking more highly of others than you do yourself. Verse 34. And this, is, this, I think, of the verses just staggers me. Thousands of people who did not plan to move there. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. Let that soak in. A welcoming culture. A caring culture. A sacrificial culture culture, a culture living by singing or humming in, in their hearts. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I just don't feel at home in this world anymore. They were, they were focused. As Hebrews says, looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. They were otherworldly. 
So that living in this world became the occasion to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ, to preach it boldly, to practice it sacrificially, welcoming strangers. I would imagine if you put yourself not now as one of the sojourners who found himself, herself, and family in Jerusalem around Passover, staying till Pentecost, being invaded by the Spirit, radically transformed. Now put yourself as one of the 120 who lived there. Your life would never be the same in Jerusalem. There was a fellow named Joseph who was also called by the apostles, Bar apostles Barnabas, which means a son of encouragement. He'd done some things to get that nickname. He was an encourager. I promise you, encouragement was needed. Encouragement was needed. They were facing unbelievable challenges. He was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, so he was well-placed in, in Jewish structure as a Levite. And now a follower of the Lamb. He sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And on and on it goes. I want to suggest to you, if a different scenario had unfolded, if in the face of the downpour of the Spirit and the proclamation of the Gospel and the salvation of multitudes, that the response of the indigenous believers had been ain't nobody got time for this. We can't help. If it had been a shuttering of the doors, a closing of the windows, a hunkering down until all these new believers finally figured out that they just weren't going to cut it in Jerusalem and made their way back home. I submit to you, that would have been a death nail to the gospel. Because how do you go from the Messiah himself stooping and washing the feet of the twelve, welcoming, 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 receiving, embracing, to a, this is my Christianity and it's a private thing. It would have cut the nerve on the very pulse of the gospel. It was one of the remarks of a secular historian who said during these days, Behold how these people love one another. And it wasn't because they'd grown up together. It wasn't because they'd hung out together. Because they had a common experience of grace. They were loving strangers. They were treating strangers as family. They were saying, my house is your house. They were saying, whatever I have and that you need is yours. Folks, all we can do is scratch the surface of this. But I think it behooves us to be challenged by this. On the one hand, how do we say with sincerity how we long for the Spirit of God to fall upon this place? And God knows our hearts. If we are not saying at the same time, here am I, Lord. Use me. I'm available. Whatever that means. Whatever that looks like, however that may inconvenience me, however it may shatter what I call my schedule. Dear God, oh church, should we not say to God if we long for Him to come in power, Lord, we want to live on Your schedule. We'll burn our calendars. You will come in power. 
Save our loved ones we pray for who are not saved. Our neighbors who, who, who are lethargic, complacent. Those we encounter. Oh God. Dear people, part of one another is doing everything we can as individuals, then as families, then as a church to be sure that I am engaged in cultivating a culture, a welcoming culture, a hospitable culture. To gather and then run over one another getting out. Places in danger. The privilege of calling this a church. It can be called a preaching station. Are we gathered to hear the gospel preached? Check that off. Off we go. There was nothing like that in Jerusalem. In fact, it was just the opposite. I don't know what the Lord will lay before us. I do know this. In 15 years of journeying with you, I've seen you as a congregation rise to amazing challenges and meet them with a gospel graciousness. But what if we commit to cultivate a culture, a welcoming culture, a hospitality culture? Could it be that heaven would see that as us preparing for God to come in this place? I've said it before. He will not unload upon His people a spiritual nursery if they're not prepared to care for what He gives to you. My appeal to you today we think about the passage we studied last week and the application of it today. When we're exhorted to welcome one another. To begin now practicing that. Practice it with one another here. Ask yourself as you leave today, what can I do? What kind of touch can I make to welcome somebody even as I depart? What can I do during the week to cultivate a welcoming spirit showing what a welcoming community looks like. How has God gifted me for that? How would He have me stretch myself beyond my comfort zone for that? Lord, show me what You would have me to do. And then how can I bless somebody by welcoming them into our lives? I promise you, the gospel of grace has a heart that beats rhythmically saying, welcome, welcome. As surely as we say to sinners, come and welcome to Jesus Christ, we must have beating in our hearts that gospel reality of a hospitable culture. That goes deep, that lasts, that expands, that opens its arms up to God and says, Lord, we're ready for the challenge. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Descend upon this place. Come, wind of God, and breathe upon these bones and make us live like we have never lived for Jesus Christ before. For Him who lived perfectly, who died vicariously, substitutionarily, bearing in His body our sin on the tree, satisfying the divine wrath of God upon sinners, and then rose from the grave infallibly, indisputably, says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. 
And he speaks one of those to us today through the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles. Welcome one another. Let's pray. Your Holy Father is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you today in Jesus' name. And oh, how we thank you for grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for how the gospel transforms. We, we read in the book of Acts and we, we say from time to time, Lord, we would love to experience something like Pentecost. And yet we have to say also, Lord, prepare us. Prepare us. Whatever you did in the lives of the 120 in the upper room, dear God, work in our lives today. Prepare us. May our hearts for Christ beat with a gospel rhythm of harmony and hospitality. So that the message we give to sinners, as we invite them to come to Christ, as we welcome them to receive the gospel, would be a message consistently borne out when in fact you come and bring them to saving faith in Christ. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen.